that uh, form part of the design, uh, what they are, um, what they're used for, etc. And then I'm going to tie all that together in, what, in terms of what the high-level design for uh, the integration of IPsec in home communities and open looks like. And then we talk about potential future work and um, then at the end, and the audience. Uh, so we'll start off by looking at the IPsec use case. So our use case is, as a cluster administrator, I need IPsec to ensure traffic between pods and the pod network is confidential, authenticated, and has not been tampered with. So if we look at this diagram here, which is a diagram of a three node OpenShift cluster, uh, we have three nodes, node X, node Y, and node Z, and they're all um, interconnected in, on an underlay network. So every node has a connection to another node, uh, to every other node on the network. And then on top of these nodes, uh, they're hosting a number of pods. So pod A, B, C, D, and E. And what we're trying to do with this work is we're trying to ensure that any traffic between nodes has been encrypted with IPsec. And the reason we're trying to do that is we're trying to uh, prevent a bad actor who is sitting on one of those underlay networks, so in the connect physical connections between the nodes, is unable to view or tamper with the traffic between the nodes. We're not looking at encrypting the traffic between, for example, node D and pod, or sorry, pod D and pod E, which are on the same uh, node. Uh, we're really only looking for traffic between the nodes, the traffic that has left the node on this pod network. The initial requirements for this were outlined in an OpenShift enhancement proposal, and the link is, is here in the presentation. Um, and I'll just go through the list of requirements uh, that we worked with initially, um, and it's listed up here. So the first one is this has to be supported in Open Kubernetes. It it's requires support for IPv4. Uh, however, uh, now subsequently IPv6 support has been added. Um, it has to work on RHEL 8. That's the version of RHEL the cluster was based on at that time. Um, it needs to have support for CA signed certificates, and I'll talk about what that means in a later slide. It's a cluster installation time uh, parameter. So that means you can enable this when you're deploying a cluster, but you can't enable it after the cluster has been deployed. And that, again, that is something we're going to look at at a later stage, that being able to, change, to enable this at runtime. And initially, we weren't really focusing on performance or the ability to offload in order to improve performance. We, we were focused on functionally getting this working and just enabling the ability to encrypt traffic with IPsec in these clusters. OK, so now let's look at some of the components that we use to enable this. The first thing to notice is there are a lot of components. I won't go into the details of all of them. We'll focus on a few key ones over the next couple of slides. But this slide does highlight the kind of breadth of components that are needed to enable this feature. And it also highlights some of the version numbers required to enable it. So let's start talking about IPsec. IPsec isn't a software component per se in, the, in this um, design. However, it is a key part of it because IPsec is a protocol we use for the um, encryption and the authentication and, and all those type of features that we talked about in the use case slide. So what is IPsec? Well, it's a suite of protocols that provide secure encrypted communication between two endpoints. So those endpoints could be two hosts that are talking directly to each other. Uh, they could be a host talking to a a gateway, an IPsec gateway, or two IPsec gateways talking to each other. Where a lot of people would be quite familiar with IPsec, I guess, is in the use case of a road warrior. So someone has their laptop, they're working remotely from the office, and over they set up a secure VPN connection with the office. And a lot of the times that's done over IPsec, where your host is talking IPsec to uh, IPsec gateway, and then the IPsec gateway and it does so in an encrypted manner. And then the IPsec gateway provides that uh, unencrypted access to the internal network of the business. IPsec is a little bit different to other similar protocols such as TLS as it, because it works at layer three at the IP layer. So what that means is you can take, uh, for example, um, an IP packet and uh, you can also encrypt 
the header information within the you know the IPsec uh, within the IPsec packet. Uh, IPsec is made up of a number of protocols. I've listed of the kind of main ones here, and we'll talk about them in a little more detail. So AH, ESP, and Ike ISACAP. AH stands for authentication header. The RFC is uh, mentioned here. And what that provides is it provides authentication and data integrity. So authentication means that it provides a way to ensure that the endpoint that you are talking to is who they say they are, and you can confirm that. And it also ensures that the data uh, trans is transmitted in a way that um, you can ensure the integrity of the data that's received. ESP provides data confidentiality. So this is, I think, what most people would think about when they think about IPsec. It's ESP uh, provides the um, secure encrypted traffic. So you uh, create a package with uh, you know, clear text, uh, with the clear text data, and the ESP packet that gets produced will have uh, an encrypted ciphertext that a bad actor will not be able to take and then determine what the, the clear text data is. And it also provides authentication and integrity as well. It can provide it. Um, ISACAMP and ICE, uh, which is Internet Key Exchange and Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocol, that's a protocol that it's a framework for establishing keys between the two hosts, uh, establishing the authentication, and basically negotiating something called a security association, which is a set of parameters that define how uh, these two endpoints should talk to each other. So it defines these security per parameters, and then it allows communication of these parameters, negotiation of these param parameters between the two endpoints. Um, what they do as well is they, it defines it in one direction. So if you have two hosts, host A and host B, uh, you have two security associations. So you have one for communication from host A to host B, and then one for communication from host B to host A. I, I think another quite an interesting thing about these protocols is they're actually IP protocols. So they work at the same level as TCP and UDP. So whereas TCP has a protocol number of six and UDP has a protocol number of 17, ESP has a protocol of 50 and AH has a protocol number of 51. And when you're doing a TCP dump on the network, you can see that so it's a little bit different than say a TCP protocol where you would see the port number of that TCP packet, but it's still a, you know, a TCP IP packet. So it, it is a little bit different in that respect. IPsec works in two different modes. So there's a transport mode and a tunnel mode. Um, tunnel mode, I haven't presented here because in the work that we've done, we use IPsec in transport mode. Um, but basically what tunnel mode is, is it'll take your entire IP packet and it will um, encapsulate it in an IPsec tunnel. And so that the IP header, uh, in this case, in this diagram it would be the, I, the outer IP header, was uh, fully encrypted. Um, however, in this work, we're enabling IP, we're using IPsec in transport mode. So in transport mode, the outer IP header remains the same. However, the all the stuff within that outer IP header gets encrypted uh, in an ESP packet. So the two software components that provide the IPsec services for Open Kubernetes and OpenShift are Libreswan and XFRM. So Libreswan is an open source implementation of IPsec and Ike, and it's a, a user space application. And XFRM is a kernel space uh, framework that provides the cryptographic services required for you know, encrypting traffic between two hosts. So, Pluto is the main Libreswan daemon. There's various other bits of software within Libreswan, but Pluto is the main daemon. And its responsibility is for negotiating the security associations with remote hosts. So as a user, you would configure Libreswan in such a way that you would define, for example, with a you know, host B, I want to uh, encrypt traffic to host B in a certain way. And using that information, uh, Pluto would attempt to negotiate 
those, a security association over Ike with that remote host based on the configuration that you pass to it. If it successfully negotiates that uh, security association, it will then use that um, by installing it into the kernel, into the XFRM framework. So the XFRM framework uh, defines two objects. It defines a state object and a policy object. And the policy object is the thing that holds the security association. So Libreson will set up some policy objects saying things like, for example, uh, if you're talking to host B, I want you to encrypt the traffic in a certain way. And uh, once that's there, then traffic that is sent will get encrypted that way. So if I look at the next slide, um, we add uh, another application called Alice. And uh, if Alice is communicating with host B, uh, Alice will send traffic uh, to the network, uh, to host B as per normal. However, XFRM will intercept that traffic because it will uh, match us a policy in XFRM. It will encrypt it based on the security association that was configured by Libreswan, and then it'll send that, uh, that traffic, that ESP or AH traffic to the remote host in a, in a secure manner. So when you're configuring Libreswan to talk to a remote host, uh, there's a number of ways that you can authenticate yourself and uh, you know, mutually authenticate two hosts. Uh, two way, three ways you can configure it. One is using a pre-shared key, two is using a self-signed certificate, and three is using a CA signed certificate. So when using a pre-shared key, what that means is that when you're uh, setting up an IPsec session between two endpoints, you need to uh, define a shared secret, so you know a long, complicated password, for example, and then configure that manually into each endpoint. So what the, the endpoints are communicating, they can ensure that they're talking to the right person, and then they can negotiate their, their, um, their session based on that. Um, that's not very practical from uh, when you're trying to scale this to hundreds of nodes, for example. Uh, so you can also use certificates. So for a certificate, uh, basically you can generate a public-private key pair where the public key is something that you can share to any node on the network as a way, uh, and that can be used to then authenticate you as a, you know, a, valid, um, a valid endpoint. Um, those certificates can either be self-signed or CA-signed. Uh, self-signed means that you uh, sign the public key yourself, which is less secure because it, it, it just means you're kind of guaranteeing that, that your, uh, your key is, is valid to the uh, other users. A more secure way of doing it is through a CA-signed certificate where when you, uh, you get a, a third party uh, to sign that certificate and say that this particular, uh, this particular key is valid. So in the case of Oven Kubernetes uh, with OpenShift, uh, we're using a scheme in which we are using CA signed certificates. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a later, uh, later slide. Um, obviously the pre-shared key just wouldn't scale in our case. And so the CA signed certificate is, is the way to go. Uh, another thing to note, and we talk about this a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit in a later slide, is when we're negotiating sessions between uh, endpoints in Open Kubernetes, we're ensure we every connection between a node has its own um, CA signed certificate key pair. So the next software component I want to talk about is Open Kubernetes. Uh, Open Kubernetes is a container networking interface, so CNI network provider for Open Kubernetes. So what that means is it's the, the software, it's a suite of software that gets deployed to the cluster and it enables uh, networking services for pods that reside in the cluster. Uh, Oven Kubernetes is part of a, an ecosystem of software based on the Open vSwitch project. So Open vSwitch or OVS is a community developed implementation of a virtual switch. So what that is, is a piece of software that resides on nodes um, and it allows uh, containers or virtual machines on the node to talk to each other or with the physical network. So Oven Kubernetes is made up of the Oven Kubernetes software itself and also software called Oven. Uh, Oven is, stands for Open Virtual Network and it's a community developed vendor agnostic network virtualization solution. 
So what happens is that uh, an administrator will configure networking in, in Kubernetes. Uh, Oven Kubernetes will then take that networking configuration and using that, it will define a, a logical view of the network. So how the different pods should be connected and what are the, you know, the networking services associated with those pods on the network. And then Oven will take that logical view of the network, uh, this virtual view of the network, and it will translate it into a configuration that can be used by OVS nodes on the cluster to uh, enable this virtualized view of the network. We don't need to go into in too much detail in this presentation. However, it is important to note that Oven Kubernetes is the software that configures the network in, can configure the network in an OpenShift cluster. The other key thing to note is that the way, in the way Oven Kubernetes sets up the network, any traffic between nodes configured by uh, Oven Kubernetes is encapsulated with the Genev protocol. So in this diagram here, we have node X, node Y, and node Z. Um, we have uh, a tunnel set up between node X and node Y, um, tunnel A, and all traffic within that tunnel is uh, traffic between pods on node X and pods on node Y, at least pods in the pod network, and similarly between other nodes on the network. Another important piece of software in, in, this, um, in this design is the cluster network operator. So the cluster network operator, it follows the operator pattern and using that, it's, it's the software that installs and upgrades networking components uh, on an OpenShift cluster. So it's responsible for deploying Oven Kubernetes and all the various components of Oven, Oven Kubernetes on the cluster. Uh, and that includes, it's responsible for deploying uh, the Oven IPsec pod, which we'll see in a later slide, which hosts the Libreswan software and uh, an OVS component called OVS Monitor IPsec. So it, it's responsible for deploying all that software within the cluster. And also it's responsible in this case for hosting a certificate signer. Um, so this is a piece of software that implements the Kubernetes Certificate Signing Request API. And what that means is the cluster ad network operator can act as a CA for the IPsec sessions. So when a node creates a key pair, it can send it to the cluster network operator for signing and then use within uh, the cluster. So let's talk a little bit about how these software components interact together to uh, enable IPsec in this cluster. Because Oven Kubernetes is responsible for configuring the network, uh, it has a visibility of all aspects of how the network has been configured in the cluster. And it can then use that information to uh, configure Libreswan to provide IPsec for you know, various traffic, some traffic on, on the cluster. So in this diagram, we have three nodes, X, Y, Z, forming part of a cluster. And as we mentioned previously, every node in the cluster sets up a Genev tunnel with every other node in the cluster. So in this diagram, we have three nodes, and therefore we have three tunnels set up between the nodes. Therefore, if, a, if pod A wants to send traffic to pod C, so pod A is a node X, it will send, node X will then send that traffic over Genev tunnel A to node Y where it gets decapsulated and sent to pod C. Whereas if pod D and pod E want to communicate with each other in node Z, that traffic will not get encapsulated by Genev. So all this pod traffic is encapsulated uh, over these Genev tunnels. So Oven Kubernetes is responsible for configuring these tunnels. So it knows what the Genev traffic, traffic will look like. So for example, uh, for Genev tunnel A, it knows that the source IP address of uh, tunnel A is node X's IP. It knows the destination IP address of Genev tunnel A is node Y's IP address. And it knows that the destination port is UDP port 6081. And it can use all this information then to configure Libreswan. So it can say that, hey, if uh, on node X, if I see traffic coming uh, from uh, X's IP address to Y's IP address for this destination port, I want you to use this particular security association uh, that I've negotiated between node X and node Y to configure the traffic between those two nodes and, and vice versa. So also 
in the case where return traffic is coming from node Y to node X. So that was a high level view. So now how are these different components that we've talked about deployed to achieve that? Well, in the cluster, we have two classes of nodes. We have worker nodes and master nodes. And master nodes are responsible for configuring and managing the cluster, whereas worker nodes are the nodes in which we deploy uh, our pods, for example. So in Oven Kubernetes, the master node hosts uh, a pod called the Oven Cube Master, which provides, uh, which has all the contains all the components required for Oven Kubernetes. And correspondingly, on the worker node, there's also a pod called the Oven Cube node, which provides the per node, per worker node uh, software required for configuring Oven Kubernetes. The cluster network operator is deployed in the master no node uh, as a pod. And uh, the IPsec pod is deployed on every worker node uh, as well. And as I mentioned, the IPsec pod contains all the Libreswan software. It contains um, also an OVS daemon that's used for uh, integrating OVS with IPsec. Um, then on the worker node, you also have OVS, which isn't actually provided in a pod. It's provided as part of the host. And obviously, then you have the host kernel, which could contain XFRM, which we, which we were talking about previously. So how is Libreswan configured? So when you add a node to the cluster, a worker node to the cluster, uh, the first thing will happen is if you've enabled IPsec, it will, CNO will deploy a pod on the worker node with all the various Libreswan uh, binaries and stuff that we need to enable IPsec. So that's the first thing that happens. Um, after that, the node will generate its own public private key pair. And it does that completely locally. So the, the, the private key um, never leaves the host. Um, however, after that, the uh, of an IPsec will request that the public key gets signed by the cluster, cluster network operator. So it's safe to send that, that certificate, it's actually a certificate to the cluster network operator and the cluster network operator CA will then sign that um, the certificate and send it back to the individual worker nodes. And um, at that point, every, you know, the, the node as is just after it's uh, been added to the cluster will have its own private key that's never left the node and I'll have a signed certificate that it got signed by the, uh, the CA uh, on the master node. And it's those two pieces of keying material that are used to authenticate that worker node with every other worker node on the, uh, the cluster. Um, so once it's done that, Oven IPsec will read the Oven configuration. So it'll read the, the network configuration for the cluster and it'll understand, okay, how are all these Geneva tunnels set up? Where are all the other nodes? And it'll use that and the keys that it that it now has uh, that it's created, and it'll use that to configure Libreswan to encrypt all Genev traffic to other nodes in the cluster. And once Libreswan has all that information, Libreswan will then use that configuration to configure XFRM in the worker nodes kernel, so the traffic that is sent uh, via that worker node over the Genev tunnel will get encrypted. So how is the traffic encrypted? So in this example, we have two worker nodes. Uh, one worker node hosts a pod called Alice and the other worker node hosts a pod, pod called Bob and Alice and Bob want to talk to each other. Alice and Bob are in the same virtual network in this cluster. So Alice will send a packet to the IP address of Bob and it will get intercepted by OVS and based on the configuration, that OVS has got from Oven and Oven Kubernetes, it will decide what to do with the pa packet and it'll determine that Bob is on a remote node, therefore it needs to encapsulate the packet within the Genev, in a Genev tunnel uh, between the two worker nodes. Uh, and then when it sends that traffic out on the wire, it gets intercepted by the XFRM framework in the kernel and the XFRM framework will um, look at that packet and determine it matches on a policy that was being previously configured by Libreswan. And based on that match, it'll determine that it's got to um, handle that pa packet using the security association that's been configured by Libreswan. Uh, 
So once it's done that, it'll uh, encrypt the traffic, it'll send it back uh, out the uh, wire, and once it's on the wire, that traffic is then encrypted that, uh, between those two worker nodes. And when the packet is received by the host that uh, the worker node that hosts Bob, uh, the reverse happens. So the network will receive the, um, the packet, the encrypted packet, XFRM will determine it matches a, a security policy and a security association that's been configured by Libreswan. It'll then decrypt the packet, send it to OVS, and an OVS based on the configuration from Oven Kubernetes will determine that that packet needs to be sent to the pod, pod that uh, Bob's pod, and the traffic will then be received by Bob in clear text. So uh, yeah, what does the future hold? Well, the roadmap is still open and um, there's still a lot of discussion about what the next steps are for IPsec in Oven Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, some things have been discussed and some things have been implemented. So as I mentioned previously, initial support was only for IPv4, uh, but in a subsequent release, we added support for IPv6 and dual stack configurations. Uh, currently, IPsec can only be enabled at cluster installation time. However, uh, and the reason for that is due to limitations about changing the, uh, the MTU during uh, runtime. Um, however, in a future release, we will enable support for um, configuring uh, IPsec support at runtime, so enabling and dis disabling that support. Currently, it only uses one cipher type, and that cipher is AES GCM 256. However, uh, it could make sense to allow the user to configure the cipher type used by uh, IPsec, and that may, may be something that will we'll change in the future. Uh, the other thing is performance, so it performs how it does at the moment. Uh, however, we may eventually need to add uh, additional performance uh, improvements or potentially offload, um, offload as well to various NICs. So that's something as well that we may look at in the future. And you know, other things, so feel free to, to reach out to me with any uh, suggestions or um, questions about that. Uh, and that's it. So uh, that's my email address there. And now I'm just gonna open it up for any questions from the audience. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That was a great talk. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment, but um, audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the Q&A section or the chat.